All team, give it everything you got. It's time to fangirl flail with fangirls going rogue. Count me in. I don't think there's anything more important in the Star Wars universe than the fans. News, discussion, and commentary from the female point of view. You call this a diplomatic solution? No, I call it aggressive negotiations. With your hosts, Teresa Delgado, Trisha Barr, and Sarah Woloski. Boy, am I glad to hear your voice. Strap in, because this is where the fun begins. I like the sound of it. Welcome, everybody, to episode 42 of Fangirls Going Rogue. I am Teresa, one of your hosts, and with me are my two amazing co-hosts. And this month, I'm going to let you guys kind of tell a little bit about some of the things you have going on, because we have tons of things we're doing as we get ready for Star Wars Celebration Orlando. So let's start with Trisha Barr. Um, What's going on with you, and how are you getting ready for the most epic con of 2017 but that sounds weird because i just said con like a like a bad thing but i meant it was like a comic con anyway <laughs> it's a celebration it's a party Yay. i get ready for the party by making spreadsheets <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> how many spreadsheets have you made i've made well i have a close spreadsheet and I have a where am I supposed to be spreadsheet and what am I supposed to pack spreadsheet and what am I supposed to put in my backpack every day spreadsheet so what's that for wow it's very organized that is I'm very impressed wait a minute and then you have all the spreadsheets and then it's just kind of like whatever it just free form it <laughs> but but the plan is somewhat in your head, so it works out, right? Somewhat in my head, yes. Okay. Sarah, <laughs> are you going to be organized with spreadsheets too? You know what? That sounds like a great idea, and I usually start some kind of list in Google Docs or Evernote that, that at least tells us like where we're going to be and when. And then I've already started a pile that is stuff to bring to Star Wars Celebration Orlando. So the pile is forming, uh, but the, I guess the next step would be to then make the pile a list form. So you're, you're one step ahead of me right now, but you're only one step ahead of me because I have been working on designs for Star Wars Celebration Orlando. So Mm. I know. So I have completed a a design for Skywalking Through Neverland. But now what's good for you guys is I'm working on a design for Fangirls Going Rogue, a special one for Star Wars Celebration Orlando. So and, and you guys have been helping me all day. Yeah, that's awesome. So as far as things that have been going on in our Star Wars world, Uh, As you guys know, I missed last month, so I've had a lot of time to think, and I started watching Star Wars from the beginning, and I actually asked on our Facebook group how people are watching them now in, like, their order, and the funniest thing about that is everybody was putting in Rogue One, Mm. and I'm like, wait, we don't, you don't have Rogue One right now, so, like, if you were watching it right now, because Greg and I were trying to decide if we were going to do like four, five, six, and then one, two, three, or one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, or what we were going to do. And it was just so funny. But we were watching Attack of the Clones last night, and there was this moment when Chancellor Palpatine is talking to Padme after the landing platform explosion, Mm -hmm. and she has the cone on her head, and he's saying... You know, oh, I just don't know what I would do if something had happened to you. Please take this extra security detail. And, of course, the whole time I'm screaming at the TV, you are a dirty, rotten liar. (laughs) Um, But there's this moment that Yoda turns his head and he looks at Chancellor Palpatine. And there's this moment of awareness that something is not right. It's like like the Force is telling him, pay attention right now. There's something not right happening. And then I just got so mad because he just ignores it. He just flat out ignores it. (laughs) Well, 
People ignore stop signs all the time, too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there should have been, what's it in the Lego one when it's a water waving the red flag? Oh, God. <laughs> I love that joke. You'll do great things for the Republic. You can't warn anyone from making a tragic mistake without a red flag. Have you ever considered being a Jedi? Big red flag! <laughs> I love it. Well, Trisha, besides lists, you've been working on something else. Is that right? Oh, I did. I did. I'm working yeah. and I, and I, I, yeah, I worked on a book that's apparently some of you guys are going to see before I am. <laughs> or have seen. What? What's the book? What's the book? Star Wars Visual Encyclopedia. I'm, it, this is true. The author is always the last to know. And so everybody is tweeting pictures of it to me, and I am so jealous. So I, I hope it's beautiful. I hope it's beautiful. You know what? It is. I have it right here. I'm holding it. I wish I could give it to you through the Skype screen here, but uh, it has like it's white. It has like embossed front, like the Star Wars letters are embossed on the front, and then you open it up to a couple pages in. Where there's a big giant dewback, and ooh, ooh, that looks cool. Well, and and then there's you, written by Trisha Barr, Adam Bray, and Cole Horton, all of whom we know, which is very That's exciting. Awesome. And they're I all wonder... nice guys. And I'll, this is a little exclusive for ooh. Fangirls Going Rogue: is that Adam and Cole and myself mm -hmm. got to see the cover during Celebration London, and <gasps> we were having pie oh. at the DK office. Oh, because you don't have cake in in London. Apparently, <laughs> you have pie, which is like the finest thing ever. So, my memory will always be Visual Encyclopedia and pie. Nice. So, I would just like to know if I can get an interview with the authors that wrote this book. <laughs> Because if I can't, it's kind of messed up. I'm just saying. <laughs> that would be true. I'm pretty sure that I know that Adam and Cole like to talk. And I, I no, I don't like to talk. I never talk. So uh, I'll just be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Says Trisha with her own podcast. <laughs> oh, wait. No, no, no. Not just one. Two. Yes. She has two. Miss I Don't Want a Podcast now has two. <laughs> It is true. And you, but here's the crazy thing. Apparently, podcasting is the path to being a Star Wars author now because did you, any of you guys get Star Wars Join the Resistance from Disney Publishing today? No, yeah, I, I have did not, not check my mail. Yes. So. It's, um, I guess it's a middle grade book mm -hmm. about Mattis Bands and it's written by some podcasters from the Nerdist. Ooh. Huh. Did you know that? No. Who? Who? No. Who wrote that? Ben Acker and oh. Ben Blacker. That's your tongue tie. <laughs> awesome. And you know what? I'm going to see them tomorrow night, actually. Oh. Well, if you don't have your book, then you won't be able to get it signed. Oh, no. <laughs> well, I hope it comes in the mail tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> There's such a sense of urgency happening here. I love it. <laughs> All right, so let's give our listeners a little sneak peek into some of the stuff that we've been working on just across all of the things that we do for Star Wars Celebration. So, Sarah, you go first because I know Skywalking Through Neverland has a couple of episodes that are going to be great for those of you that are prepping for Celebration. Yes, it's very true. So even if you have been to several Celebrations or you haven't been to any uh, Skywalking Through Neverland, we just put out our Star Wars Celebration Orlando Survival Guides, and it's parts one and two because we had so much info. Episode 157 and 158 of Skywalking Through Neverland, and uh, some of our Skywalkers came on to really give us some great tips, along with Richard and I, of course, since we've been to several. And also, we had DJ Elliot, who, of course is the DJ on the main stage, kind of the warm-up host for the main stage of Celebration. And he was on to give some behind-the-scenes stories as well. So we, we had several people on, and there's just so much great info to listen to. And that's been shared around several Facebook groups. So thank you if you've already listened, and it's a great guide. 
And Trisha, what's going on with hyperspace theories right now? We're chewing, waiting for some good things to speculate about after celebration. So oh. I, I feel like we'll, we'll have to know. We've been talking a lot about storytelling, about the, the storytelling of Rogue One. The Oscars gave us a lot of little, you know, when they want to do a lot of publicity, they make sure they show the special effects. So we talked about that. Digi- digitally recreating uh, characters and stuff like that. And more storytelling behind the scenes. And now we're ready. Mm. We were ready to do some live reaction stuff at the convention. So this is kind of like my stuff, my meat and potatoes. And then <laughs> Brian Johnson does something like someone tweets at him and says, hey, it's my birthday. What's the last Jedi mean? And he tweets back, the final Jedi? Uh. I'm like, nah. <laughs> okay, well, there goes the speculating. <laughs> That's so mean. Oh, crazy. So we released a new kind of show. As you guys know, we have our main show, Fangirls Going Rogue. And then we have our priority transmissions, which are just special nuggets for you. I like the fact that we're using nuggets, not of the chicken variety, of (laughs) the news variety. (laughs) But there's a new one. If you guys haven't heard it, it's called You Talk, We Listen. And I wanted Trisha to talk a little bit about this and how we're going to be approaching this as we move forward so that you guys can hopefully get in on this. And it's sort of what we're viewing as like our um, podcast mentoring program, if you will. So, Trisha, what is You Talk, We Listen? Well, I mean, we've always talked about it. Our goal is to get more people visibility. And so I thought it would be fun because we have our Facebook discussion group now that you can go to and join. And Ajua Adama and Sandra Shoot were said they're friends. So I thought what way to have people be comfortable in a situation learning how to podcast and just have them on. And I don't, I'm not talking, I'm listening. So I'm asking them questions and letting them just go for it. And it's really fun because sometimes we get in these circles where we, we talk about, obviously we don't always agree, but you can get in kind of a confirmation bias. So it's fun to listen to other people's point of view, how they reacted, how they've shared Star Wars. And I, it was an awesome conversation. So this was Rogue One. And I think we'll do it with other things, different, not necessarily Rogue One next time. You know, maybe we'll do one for the end of Star Wars Rebels, but it'll be one of us asking questions, other people talking. And it lets you learn about other people. And really kind of my... My inspiration when I brought this up at the planning session was having the Hunt sisters on Mm. and just getting to listen to them when we did that episode because it was so much fun to, I mean, oh my gosh, that was the funniest fun when they were talking about Jar Jar, like, you know, kids like Jar Jar, (laughs) so is their pathway in, so Mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. and Getting different viewpoints on, on, on different Star Wars things. Is really is really amazing, and yeah, different ages, different everything. So I love this idea that you brought up, and we are excited to do this. So how, if people want to be part of this, how can they? Easiest way is just to send us an email, contact at fangirlsgoingrogue.com, and say you're interested. We've already had someone bring you say that they wanted to be involved and we'll definitely look at getting different types of voices. So, you know, it'll, it, it will happen as, you know, it's one of those things that we, we're not going to do it every month, but it'll happen probably quarterly and as things are appropriate to get different voices, but definitely I I know people message, but message can get you lost in Mm -hmm. the, in the messenger. As I always say, email if you really want it then we can search for it and go oh yeah who said they were interested so and the great thing about email is that we all get a copy of that email so if you send in the email you know that you've reached all of us right and something that I would include maybe in your email is especially if you have a really good idea if you're like you know I would really like to talk about the ending of season three of rebels or I would really like to talk about 
this specific thing and it's something you're really passionate about, Mm -hmm. put that in your email because that Mm -hmm. gives us something to associate with you about how we can approach the you talk we listen. So, um, you know, if it's just like sort of a blanket, I like Star Wars, it kind of makes it a little bit harder for us to determine like how we're going to use each person and like where it's appropriate and with what's going on in fandom and all that stuff. So the more info you put in there, the better. Definitely. That's such good just advice in general. I have so many people that send and say, I want to rate for fangirl. I'm like, great. What Mm -hmm. do you want to rate? Like, that's awesome. You want to talk? Tell us what you want to talk about. If you want to rate for something, it's just because if you just say, I want to talk, then we don't know. Like, what do you want to talk about? So that's definitely the best advice for any, anything. If you like, you want to rate for starwars.com. Don't just say, I want to rate for starwars.com. Send them an email and say, I want to rate about this Mm -hmm. and give them a thing. So Mm -hmm. life lesson. Okay, so as of March 1st, we got some really neat information about Hyperspace Mountain and some stuff behind the scenes about how Disneyland created it and put it together. And Trisha, I believe this is something that you found over on StarWars.com. So why don't you tell us a little bit about all of this? I first got wind of this because the Star Wars show did a segment about Hyperspace Mountain the same day. And they... They talked about writing it seven times and they got to interview the guy who's in charge of it there. And I was like, I wouldn't, don't know if I could write it seven times. But did you know that they actually recorded the music at the same spot where they recorded the original music for the first movie? <gasps> oh, Sarah, did you not know this? I didn't know this. This is news to me. I'm, I'm going to like dive into this article after we're done recording here because uh, this is exciting. Yeah. But that information is actually on the Star Wars show, which is a different gentleman. But hmm. the reason I liked this article is because it's Dan Brooks from StarWars.com interviewing Alyssa Lagozio. And I hope I said her last name right. She's associate producer, Walt Disney Imagineering and producer of Hyperspace Mountain. So is that like the coolest job you could have? Yes. No joke. Except if you're working on Star Wars Land, which actually at a run (laughs) Disney event, talk to the people around you in your corrals because I was actually standing next to a Walt Disney Imagineer who was working on Star Wars Land uh, for one of the races. So that was pretty cool. That is pretty cool. But it's just cool because they talk about how this is actually a story. There's actually an adventure in you know, if you could pay attention enough to, oh my gosh, I'm going to die on a roller coaster, you're not going to die. But that's sort of like the intention, right? You have a mission, you have a place thing you have to do, you have, you know, you're, you think you're part of a squadron, which I love, and then the music's all coordinated. So anyway, they just talked about kind of this. I feel like this is kind of the pre-hype of, like, they're, they were both people who talked about working on this. this is kind of like their high bar that they've really decided this is great. They have experience and maybe this is more of what they're trying to do with Star Wars land. Oh. So, yeah, that's just kind of the vibe I felt that you're going to have, you know, they're telling you a story. It's not just about you're going on a ride anymore, right? You're going to go and have an experience. And so I thought it was fun. So definitely check out that article and definitely check out the Star Wars show. Yeah, and so, then if you can, ride Hyperspace Mountain, which I'm so glad that they've just kept going for over a year now, really, except for when they changed it to Ghost Galaxy over uh, the October holidays. Mm-hmm. So I have a question about Hyperspace Mountain for both of you and just kind of opinions. When Star Wars Land opens, do you think that traditional Space Mountain should go back because of the iconicness of Space Mountain and Disneyland and, you know, things that are just, I don't know, I guess the best word is iconic. When people think of Disneyland, a lot of times they think of Space Mountain. Do you think it should go back or should it stay as is? I think that, no, it should not go back to original Space Mountain, it should just stay Hyperspace Mountain because Hyperspace Mountain is a better ride. (laughs) Trisha, what about you? No, I think it's okay separate. I mean, part of the thing about Star Wars Land is it's supposed to be sort of an in-universe experience and you go into hyperspace mountain and they may take you into the, that universe too. I mean, some things are not going to be 
in in Star Wars Land, and I'm fine with that. I I actually think the Hyperspace Mountain is such an awesome ride compared to what it was, and even like Ghost Galaxy was cool. But I hope they do. If they don't do that at Magic Kingdom, I'm going to be so depressed. I'm going to be sad. <laughs> <laughs> and it'd be really sad. So they have to. I hope some Imagineers listening and they're listening to me saying sad if you don't make them all hyperspace mountains. Well, so here's my my look on it is that, you know, I think it's okay for Disneyland if it stays hyperspace mountain because they already changed the ride anyway. Space Mountain at Disney World and Disneyland are two very different ride experiences. One of them makes you feel like you're on the Matterhorn and the other one makes you feel like you're on a roller coaster that you're not going to come off of with whiplash. So um, I can't ride Space Mountain at Disney World and it makes me sad because Mm. I have neck and back problems from car wrecks and stuff. And unless I brace my neck with my hands, I can't ride it, which is why I can't ride the Matterhorn bobsleds. But if you, if they were to change Space Mountain at Disney World, they need to first change it to the two car, two person, like side by side. And they need to change the ride mechanic so that it's smoother and less jerky. And they need to just change it with the speakers and everything. Because I don't think they can do an overlay at Space Mountain at Disney World the way it is now, Trisha. I don't think they have that ability. Since Space Mountain was done first at Disney World and then at Disneyland, it's like they, you know, improved it. You know what I mean? Well, they are doing the overlay at Disneyland Paris, which is considerably different than either of the... It's so different in Disneyland Paris. And it was actually like a steampunk version. And you go outside, you go upside down. I'd actually Mm -hmm. say it's more like rock and roller coaster. But I think if they want to, they will. So, but it is... Yeah, the ride is definitely very rough. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Magic Kingdom, so. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think one of the other things I've heard was the reason they don't do overlays. So, for, like, example, they do overlays at It's a Small World, Haunted Mansion, and Space Mountain at Disneyland. Correct, Sarah? Uh, Yes. And what I've heard from people who work at Disney World, the reason they don't do it is because at Disney World, a lot of times people will only ever go to Disney World one time. Mm -hmm. And because of the amount of traffic that's there, they don't have time to, like, take the ride, those big rides down for, like, a month and do the overlay and then bring them back up. Because for some people, it will be the only trip that they ever take to Disney World. So I don't know if that holds any truth or validity. No, it, it does. Like, they would get major complaints over there. Whereas Disneyland is a more frequented park by locals. So, so the Disneyland people are more forgiving about stuff being down. You know, does that make sense? It yeah. does. But I, I still wish that they would change Space Mountain to at least the same ride mechanics that they have at Disney World. Because I really want to ride it. Or at Disneyland, you mean? <laughs> yes. I wish the Disney World Space Mountain was the same ride mechanics as Disneyland Space Mountain. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. That's my only like, thing. Likely they would make a change. Totally looking as an engineer, they would make a change at any point they were going to do a major overhaul. Mm-hmm. So they would time it the same time. At some point, they have to take all rides down and refurbish. So if, if it happened, it would happen when they did that. Right. Mm-hmm. Now, this next article is really cool because it's about um, Riz Ahmed, who played Bodhi Rook in Rogue One. But what did you like about this particular article in Riz Ahmed? Well, I mean, what Riz Ahmed is saying, and we talked about him on previous episodes about how these actors are all from Rogue One, their own heroes in their own right, is just being able, for him to being able to play a character who isn't a stereotype, who isn't, you know, he he isn't a terrorist. He's had to play those things. He gets to play hero. He gets to play somebody who does something for good, who is part of a system. So this is him trying to make the point at representation matters and that people need to see themselves being good. There's also a video going around of uh, about their, you know, just the representation for Asians across the board of 
it's when you don't feel like you're represented. So you don't see yourself. You don't think I can be. So they have, you know, it's a video of a, a young Asian girl looking at all the characters. And we've talked about this, uh, you know, that there's a lot of blo- uh, brunettes in Star Wars right now <laughs> of women. And so if you don't see yourself in the story, you start to think, well, I can't be that. I'm very excited for Kelly Marie Tran to see how she plays out in The Last Jedi. So it's it's just a, a continuing conversation. And he had this conversation. He presented it to the British government. This is He wasn't just talking about it. He's been talking about it. But, I mean, he, he took it all the way to the top, sort of supporting it. And actually, over in, in England, they're a little bit more behind the diversity in in all hiring practices in mm. Hollywood. So every behind the scenes, in front of the camera, and behind the camera, and so it was nice to see him get up there and speak his mind. And I think he will continue. I actually think he threw Rogue One a little shade at the Oscars even when he presented. So mm. he sort of made a swipe about the. Uh, uh, you know, we even have, you know, not real care- actors as far as digital representation. So it, if you're oh, an right. actor, yeah, I mean, if you're an actor, that isn't necessarily good news. To no. see that, so, you could, so I was like, yeah, I think he'll talk about anything, which makes him very Diego Luna, too. He'll talk about anything as well. Oh, yeah. And I agree with what you said about it. Like, if you don't see yourself represented, a lot of times you often think that you can't do something. And I think that representation is very important. That's been sort of one of the big things when it comes to just Disney in general is them diversifying and representing people of new male females of all races and stuff like that. And that's why I'm really excited about um, and I, it just happens to correlate that today is Moana Day because mm-hmm. Moana came out on Blu-ray today. And from what I've seen just on Facebook and then, you know, also kind of in the news, like so many people are going out and buying the movie, which is so awesome. It's all that whole representation thing. And I'm so, glad yeah. that people are accepting it, you know, and that they're they're willing to watch this movie that doesn't have a blonde haired, you know, white princess. It has, you know, this amazing, strong Pacific Islander, you know, persona. And and I hope, I really do hope that the way Riz Ahmed has been for Muslim characters and then also for like Diego Luna for Hispanics and things like that, that the Pacific Island people see this and that they are like, you know, empowered in some way. And so that's really cool. Oh yeah. Well, in fact, I went to a Moana event at Walt Disney animation studios where the director Ron Clements was, was there and he was speaking about his experience of going to the Pacific islands after Moana was out and going with the star and like over in the Pacific islands, she is like, a a goddess there. Like people just absolutely adore her and adore Moana because it does represent who they are. And, and it was just an amazing story to hear. And also speaking of Disney and representation is the fact that Beauty and the Beast, the live action movie is coming out on March 17th. And I've actually seen it. And LeFou is, who's played by our favorite, Josh Gad, he is actually playing him as a gay character. And it's clear in the movie. And honestly, he is my favorite character in the film, in Beauty and the Beast, because he he's just, the way he plays it and his story arc, he actually has a story arc in Beauty and the Beast. And it it makes a lot of sense. And I think a lot of people can relate to him. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, I know it's not Star Wars, but I do feel like it's an important thing for us to just talk about briefly because it is Disney. Mm-hmm. But that this particular thing has caused an uprising, you know, from different different parts that are, you know, more conservative and don't want, you know, outright gay things in their movies and stuff like that. But I just want to say that if you rewatch the animated Beauty and the Beast, <laughs> there was something up with LeFou mm-hmm. anyway. They just didn't put a name on it. Right. But I mean, come on. He was so obsessed with Gaston. There is no, there's absolutely no way <laughs> that he wasn't gay to begin with. So I'm just, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wait a minute. And, and people are getting upset about a story of, that's a beast and a human being. Mm. Mm. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh gosh. Well, I'm just that, saying. That takes me to another thing. There was recently Emma Watson, who plays Belle in Beauty and the Beast. She did the cover of Vanity Fair, and she did a very like a kind of risque cover. And I, from what I've heard and some of the articles I've read, there's a portion of the feminist community that is just in this outrage about this cover that she did, saying that she cannot possibly be a feminist because of this, the way that she had her pictures taken in Vanity Fair. And Trisha, you quoted this tweet, which actually led me to find this stuff, but she has one of the best lines ever. And I'm, I'm just going to say it now. So just be, just be prepared. But she says, I don't know what my tits have to do with my feminism. (laughs) (laughs) And it's just so great because it is true. I mean, you can be a sexy person and flaunt it and be so proud of who you are you know and to be confident in yourself and still be a feminist and still be fighting for you know equal pay and equal rights with women and stuff like that and just because you dress a certain way doesn't like there's these boxes that people are getting put in Mm-hmm. Let's circle and, it back around to conventions and dressing like Slave Leia because mm-hmm. it used to be that if you dress like that, you were a fake geek girl. You just wanted yep. people to look at you and you didn't really know anything about Star Wars. You just wanted people to look at you. But actually, most of those women dress like that because they felt like that moment is a moment that Leia is very powerful and that she kills mm-hmm. the hut. She gets to be Claudia Gray, calls her. Puts it in canon now in what the bloodline, she's the hut slayer, right? Yeah. So, you know, it's it's about what Emma Watson's, you know, and she's a spokesperson for the women's movement at the UN. Essentially, it's not it's about having a choice. You can dress that way if you'd like, or you don't have to. I actually remember standing at celebration with Jason Fry at the party for let's see, it was the 501st party with three ladies in the Hut Slayer costume, let's call it that. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about galactic politics and philosophy. So, and a lot of other heady things, heady (laughs) discussion. And it was kind of that moment where I was like, hey man, this is pretty awesome because these ladies are talking smart stuff and they want to wear the costume. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've worn the costume and I mean, yes, I can talk Star Wars. Obviously I'm on a lady Star Wars podcast. But hey, you know what? Here's the thing. Here's the thing. And people will make comments about that. But if you've got it and you can flaunt it and you can use it, why not do it? I don't know. That's just me. That's how I feel. I mean, it's like if I can if I can talk my way out of a ticket by having good hair and a sweet voice, <laughs> then are you serious? Like, I'm not going to not do that. Right. It's kind of like so, flirting. Yeah. I just feel like there's too much judgment going on and there's too much of that. And, you know, I, I am Catholic and for Lent, what I actually decided to give up was drown or drowning. I was started (laughs) reading a word, um, was judging people too quickly. Mm. And so, you know, it's one of the things that I noticed as I was kind of thinking about all this and then this happened and I was like, wow. And as we're, talking about judging people too quickly like we're getting a lot of cast announcements and stuff for Han Solo which is sort of interesting because the movie has just started shooting and we have some you know diversity coming into the cast even more than we had before so we have Michael Kenneth Williams and Tandy Newton who were both just announced but of course we don't know who they're playing Mm -mm. Um, and there was also that cast photo which I just thought was adorable that was really cool I don't know if you guys did y'all see the the Han Solo cast photo where they're kind of like in the cockpit. Oh the yes, Falcon. yeah, that was cute. I was like, oh yeah, he's definitely going to be Han Solo type. So uh, that that worked for me. And yeah, and I see that Michael Kenneth Williams now he is in The Wire. Have you guys seen this? I have never seen that. Okay, what about you, Trisha? I haven't either. I'm just generally excited about the diversity. So okay, I'm hey. I'm ready for this. I I am ready for the Han Solo movie. And if you watch Hail Caesar, you will be ready for <laughs> the Han Solo movie. So Alden Ehrenreich, say that fast five times. Alden Ehrenreich. Alden Ehrenreich. Alden Ehrenreich. Alden Ehrenreich. Alden Ehrenreich. 
How'd I do? Said like a true podcaster. <laughs> I remember when, when we were trying to remember how to say Lupita Nyong'o. Oh, yes. Like, mm. you know, it was like, I was like, I'd say it before we podcasted. And now I was like, okay, I got it. No problem. <laughs> Now, was it on this particular show? Oh, maybe it wasn't. I think I thought it was where some where we were talking about. Um, oh my gosh, what's her name? She's in Game of Thrones. She who's in oh. Han, in the Han Solo movie? Uh, Amelia Clark. Yes. Yeah. Did somebody said I needed to watch Me Before You. Yes. Or whatever. It, yes. Okay, I watched it. Did you cry? She's amazing. No, I didn't cry, but she's amazing, and that <laughs> movie was cry? awesome. Well. You didn't- I watched it during the month of hell, Trisha. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and my emotions were turned off other than me being able to say, like, I really like this movie. Oh. So, but um, I, I got it from Redbox, and I watched it because I felt like that was some homework I was supposed to do. And so I did. <laughs> and it was very, very, very good. And Finnick blew me away. <laughs> Finnick. <laughs> that's not his name, but that's his name to me. <laughs> oh, because he plays Finnick in uh, in the Hunger Games. The Hunger yeah, Games, Hunger gotcha. Day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She's very. Um, that's a hard role that movie, and she's funny and tough, and there's a lot of emotion. So she mm-hmm. has a lot. He she has some range, and yeah, and her even wardrobe. without blonde hair, <laughs> her wardrobe was amazing. <laughs> oh nice well i'll have to like, watch that this yeah you need to watch that <laughs> i need to watch that but speaking of homework uh i did watch silverado which is amazing and the music just blew me away and i want to see this film like in the theater because i think it needs to be seen in the theater on a big screen so thank you trisha for recommending that as homework yeah and if people haven't listened the reason i recommended silverado is is written by Lawrence kasdan also directed Mm -hmm. and i feel like they've talked about han solo well we know that they've talked about it being a western vibe and if i were going to go back and say that you could get a western vibe out of kasdan it would be silverado and so i yeah I just feel like that's a good kind of inclination of what we might get, which is there's some fun, just goofiness in the movie, but it also gets pretty rough. At oh, parts. yeah. Yeah. Intense, intense moments along with the levity that is always so welcome in these. Films. Do we know anything about the music for the Han Solo movie? Has Goodness, been I don't I don't think so. I don't think we know mm-hmm. a composer. I, I would have I would know if there was one announced. So, no. All there, right. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Mm. Well, something we do know that they did announce is that Rebel Season 4 is coming. So that's good. Yes. Now, did you... You guys were pretty sure. I'm, I'm confident that all three of us were believing there was going to be another season, right? I wasn't sure because of little things that I've heard and and the fact that we were you know, getting some story arcs ending on some of these characters. I wasn't sure if there was going to be a season four, actually. So I was, it was unclear for me. And Trisha, did you feel like there was going to be a season four? I wasn't sure. They're, they, they definitely have been wrapping up some things. They bring in some things in and tying them up. Mm-hmm. And so I, I feel like we're, you know, they're definitely... They definitely have a plan. I can that you remember. I was trying to think if there was a time in Rub in the Clone Wars where we thought, "Oh, we just don't know where they're going," right. and and this one feels more like they have a trajectory. So I and they've talked a lot about how you know we've seen more discussion about how they've learned things from Disney, and Disney doesn't historically do long. Um, you know, they don't do long series, so you don't see eight seasons of the Marvel Avenger because by the time a kid, you know, they oh. maybe start when they're eight and yeah. they're by 12, they're on to something new. So you have to go back and get a new story. But so you see like the Avengers come out, they just do a new arc. It's essentially, and they might bring in a new character, do it a little different. So there's Disney is looking at it as their kids are going to age up and then they have to bring a new group in. So they have to have a new character and I also feel like Ezra's getting really close to adulthood here so that's kind of the marker too right right Mm -hmm. 
Now, how are you guys feeling about this? Is season four going to be it for y'all? Because I was, I was kind of like unsure about season three at the beginning, but now I'm pretty much like, yep, season four, we're done. Um, we're so we're way there, especially with the last episode, Secret Cargo. I'm like, oh, we are, we're way too close for comfort. Right. Oh, so you think season four is the final season, right? That's it. Yeah. Final, final, final. Yeah, that's what I think. I I think we're with you there. I, I, I feel like, yeah. Yeah, I I kind of feel the same way. I don't even know if it'll be as long. I've, I I don't know for... There are... People always say, oh, don't say those. There's no episodes that are fillers. They all mean something. But I still feel like there were episodes that are like, well, we'll make it mean something eventually. But we're doing an episode because we have so many on the schedule. So we do know that Dave Filoni is now overseeing animation he's not the direct supervisor for star wars Rebels, although you can see his hand in everything that mm-hmm. happens so that says to me that they're that they're building for more stuff so even as maybe rebel starts to wind down we won't have a problem with having more characters i certainly don't think it's the end of seeing sabine so <laughs> you know Yeah. No, I don't think it's the end, but I, you know, what's interesting is that I can kind of see them paving the way for some of these characters to possibly make an appearance live action. I see there's some doors staying open that could potentially lead to that, which would be really awesome. Mm. Um, I know we've had recently, like Rosario Dawson had said that she would want to play Ahsoka. Um, I don't think that that would actually happen. I think that Ahsoka would be a CG character, so you know they'd probably have Ashley doing the voice and, and things like that. But um, there's some doors that are kind of open, which I would, like. Would you be opposed to either of you guys to uh, move animated movies? On the no, big... no, not at all. I would love that. Yeah, I, I I've always felt like when I've seen these episodes in a theater situation which isn't that often but when you do it there's so much quality that I enjoy seeing it in a movie I would love if they would put some of the arcs in a movie theater like what do they call them the fathom events or something like that where you could go see certain arcs I would I would really dig it if they did that in fact I tweeted that at my last live tweet of the latest episode the secret cargo of Star Wars Rebels and it got a lot of response like I was like this should be seen in in the theater and everyone was like yes yes and they were tweeting at Dave Filoni so hopefully they heard us. <laughs> <laughs> well, they hear us. Yeah. Especially if you're using the hashtag Star Wars Rebels. Yes. Oh, yes. So speaking of stuff like that, we're hoping we'll get a Rebels announcement of some sort soon and character or like people from Rebels that will be at Celebration. But that hasn't just happened just quite yet. But there have been some announcements and there we wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about some places that you can definitely find us during Celebration. We don't have the panel schedule yet, so that makes it a little bit difficult. So some of this stuff might shift around a little, but we do know some places that for sure you can find us. So one of them is going to be the podcast stage because we're confident. (laughs) Not because we know anything, but just because we're confident. We actually don't know yet, but we're hoping. We're hoping podcast stage. But for me... Jedi News is going to be having a table in on the show floor with the Rebel Legion. And so there will be some times where you can find me actually manning the Jedi News booth. So you can come by and say, hi, I do not have those times yet. And I won't until they release a panel schedule. But that is one thing. Um, I think all three of us are going to be at Galactic Nights at Hollywood Studios on Friday night. Yes. So we're... Totally, totally pumped and excited about that. And then they just announced recently the Collector's Social Room, which is sort of an area for all of the nerdy, geeky people like me who collect stuff and basically just hoard Star Wars things. (laughs) Um, I plan on being in that room periodically throughout the convention to talk to all my other fellow hoarders. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Well, you, you hoard neatly, right? I do. I hoard very neatly. I don't hoard in piles <laughs> that block my door or anything. That's hilarious. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to call you a hoarder now. You hoarder. But people already do. Okay. 
Well, that's funny. All right. Well, where I'm going to be at Star Wars Celebration, once again, subject to change, but I pretty much nailed down all the evenings events. So like Thursday, I will be at Drowning in Moonlight, which is the Carrie Fisher Gala event happening. And I will be on the stage, on the podcast stage. There's going to be a giant podcast along with Richard Woloski. So we will both be up there. And that sounds like a fun event for lots of podcasters, or if you know a lot of podcasters, it might be fun to go because, uh, you know, there will be a lot there that you can just say hello to and and meet. And then, yes, Galactic Night's definitely going to be there. And then on Saturday, it's the 501st party. Now, Trisha, will you be at this one? Yes. All right, so Trish and I will be at the 501st party on Saturday. And then on Sunday, somewhere... During Sunday, of course, is Easter Sunday. So somewhere during convention hours, probably in the morning, like 11 a.m. or something, Richard and I of Skywalking Through Neverland, we are going to host a Hoojib Hop, (laughs) which will be something like the running of the Wilro Hoods, in which a bunch of people will get together. We'll probably give you Hoojib ears and we'll be looking for something like a scavenger hunt, but around the convention center. So it's going to be really fun. And we're still in the planning mode of that. But definitely that will be something that I will be at. It would be Um, really helpful if they released a schedule because then we could really plan things. Yes. So ready for a schedule. I know. I I mean, we know, we obviously know that the 40th is going to, how they're going to kick it off, which is a little different than Anaheim. And that then we'll have the Last Jedi on Friday and then Saturday, I'm guessing, is going to be Rebels. Yeah, I'm guessing, like too. Like have, have done. And then Future Filmmaker, you never know. They may shake everything up and not know. I definitely will be on a panel talking about the visual encyclopedia. So Ooh. look for that on the schedule. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, it sounds good. Um, You know, I think Trisha and Sarah are going to be a lot more um, accessible as far as being at events and parties and stuff like that. I know I'm not as much because I'm taking this particular celebration for me is going to going to be a combination of things. It's going to be sort of a release of stress, also a family vacation and you know at the same time. So, I'm going to be around, but I may not be around as much as they are. So, uh let me know if you do want to see me though cuz I will make sure that I can be you know, where people can find me and let you guys know where I am at. So I have no problems with doing that at all. At awesome. All. Trisha, you brought up the Oscars earlier and you talked about how there's a lot of technical awards and that they show clips of different things and that you guys were talking about this on Hyperspace Series. But I thought it would be a good thing for us to talk about as far as we've talked about a little bit before about how sometimes the geek movies don't really get as many awards and they that kind of recognition so does star wars really deserve more oscars is kind of my question for you guys and why don't we take it back a little bit to 1978 so to those particular oscars because as i believe they had 10 nominations that year correct wow yes yes which is a huge deal. Ten nominations is massive. I Yeah, and I think that speaks to just the technical quality of the film and, and how it, break, it broke down boundaries because they won six of those ten nominations. Yeah, we, well, here's, okay. the, here's the ones that they got nominated didn't win for. Original okay. screenplay, best picture, Supporting actor for Alec Guinness and director. So those were the ones that were nominations that they didn't win for. The wins were art direction, costumes, original score, sound, film editing, and visual effects. Wow. So all the technical stuff. Essentially, yes. It's, you know, it's just that if you think about it too, back then, the special effects were a big deal. And... Of course, a lot of people were disappointed Rogue One didn't get that. Or what was the other one? It was sound that they were up for this Mm -hmm. time. And 
I didn't feel like either one of those, they were the best in that technical group in the category. Jungle Book won for special effects. And I believe all you guys saw Jungle Book as well. Yeah. Yes. And they deserved that. Well, yeah. I, I mean, I thought Jungle, I think the race for special effects for me was the most exciting you know, even more than best picture because there was so, so many good films up for nomination for that. Right. Because I believe Dr. Strange was yep. nominated too. And here's something that I actually picked this up from the special effects on Moana, but I think it applies here that these technical awards are so important. And in some cases, I believe they're more important than best picture because these awards mark the development of different technologies and things like that, that are used for every movie following Mm -hmm. to come after. And so if these movies have that kind of an impact on every movie that is going to come after it, then why are these particular awards not seen as being as important as Best Picture? That's a well, very it, good question. And, you know, I think Star Wars wins where, you know, it wins in popularity. It's obviously a popular movie. So like video music, movie awards and, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, the MTV movie awards, stuff oh. like that. <laughs> People's Choice Awards, they win those type of things where they're popular, but this is specifically looking at it as far as technical achievement. There's also an interesting thing, the Academy, how the nominations run is that the the people in that specific that are members in that category do the nominating. Mm -hmm. So the people who know about it nominate and then the, everybody in the Academy votes for Uh. those nominations so if you were going to look at it this way say specifically for rogue one and special effects jungle book needed their special effects work it did the movie didn't work if all the animals didn't work the kid was important too but they needed everything else to make that believable as so everything had to work in that movie it is amazing technical achievement for rogue one one of the things that they were heralding was that they created an actor who was dead and and also an actress who was alive. Now, the people who are special effects people nominated it, but you were asking actors uh, to vote mm-hmm. that as a special achievement. That is definitely not going to help you in the overall voting, I believe, that that actually hurt them. So, and the other thing was they were specific about this, that in the special effects that if Tarkin didn't work, they were just going to take it out of the story. The movie still would have existed. Jungle Book wouldn't have existed if they hadn't have made it all work. Wow. So, you know, there is a bit of holistic uh, approach. And then, you know, other times it can just be what is it up against. But like editing, when in 1977, when that movie was made, when Star Wars was made and it won, the editing specifically, you know, if you read about Marsha Lucas who came in, she recut things. The trench run wasn't working. They had multiple editors working on it. The editing makes that movie work. It's not mm-hmm. as much the acting. It's, you know, the way the trench run is cut, that at the mu- music and the way it all falls together. She and her fellow editors deserved an editing nomination and yeah. an award for it. And so... It, is that what has the editing, you know, there are a lot of things that have fallen to the wayside in Star Wars itself. And also, if you look at it holistically, George Lucas was doing kind of his, I'm doing it my way. I'm not doing it a Hollywood way. And he got, he was part of Hollywood in 1977. And in 1978, he's rewarded for doing something truly remarkable. And since then, they've had what just Empire Strikes Back has won. I believe. Is that right? And and then since then, you know, part of his thing has been being the anti-establishment. So <laughs> in a way, you know, th- I don't know that he necessarily or Star Wars necessarily what wanted to be part of the system. That was part of its kind of tooth in the door, so to speak. <laughs> right. And, you know, it, 
what it really comes down to are the people who are enjoying the movies. Movies are made for all of us as an audience. And so what really matters? Do we care if our if the movie wins best picture? Maybe. Maybe I do just because I like the Oscars and because I like watching award shows and it's always fun when something I like wins. But let's take, for example, this year, the best animated film. Mm -hmm. There were two Disney animated films going head to head. I'm really fine with either. But it was fun to just play around with that competition of is it Moana, is it Zootopia, whatever. And either one is perfectly fine. But I will tell you one of the things that does bug me about awards is now we have these categories for you know, best animated picture versus best an- or best picture. It's like we have to put them in two separate right. categories. And there was a time when there wasn't two separate categories and an animated film did win. Beauty and the Beast. Fiction. Exactly. And it was shortly after that that they split the categories. And I feel like we're going to get to a point to where we have to split them, you know, where we've got like best comedy, like they do for the Grammy, or it's not the Grammys, but the Golden Globes. Oh, yeah, the Golden Globes, yeah. The Golden Globes. And, you know, I think at that point it sort of dilutes the whole point of the award system. But I think that what really matters when it comes to a film is the way it's received by its audience. And if it made an impact on them and the messages that are being received from the film. Because if you ask me, regardless of whether or not Rogue One got an award, it really won. Because it made way more money than a lot of people thought it was going to. The message struck home for so many people. And I think that that is what really and truly is the most important thing when it comes to movies. As far as you guys are concerned, what matters for you? When you go to a movie. Well, I was going to actually respond back to the fact that Best Picture should almost be given, uh, like, post the year after 10 years has passed. Because it's like what films hold up over time should be even another award, <laughs> if mm-hmm. you think about it. Yeah. Like, if you look back at 1977 and the film that won... Annie Hall? Yes, it was Annie Hall. It was Annie Hall won over Star Wars. Well, which movie is watched more today, 40 years later? Obviously, yeah. Star Wars. So it, it's. I think it would be really neat if they added an award in for like most like changed history kind of picture. But I guess they have AFI film awards for that kind of thing. But th- th- that's what they really should do is see which films hold up over time. Because who's going to watch Birdman in 40 years? Not me. The only one I can think of that was best best picture that I will still really watch is Titanic. (laughs) 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 Which is funny. And I also see the award shows, they they make me slightly angry. I I permanently cannot stand Russell (laughs) Crowe. Despite the fact that he's probably a great actor. And it has to do with the fact that one year Tom Hanks was nominated Uh and Russell Crowe was and Russell Crowe beat Tom Hanks. And I just don't see how somebody on a stage acting with a whole bunch of other gladiators out acts someone who acted with a volleyball for an entire movie. (laughs) So you're you're mad because Maximus beat. It's ridiculous. You tell me how that even makes any kind of sense. You know, I mean, geez. Oh, that's so And I'm still mad to this day. Just so you guys know. It's a constant thing. I get okay. grief about it all the time. But my point is, is that there's movies that leave impacts on us for whatever reason. And when you guys go to a movie, what is the thing that is most important to you that you take home with you? Ah, Well, for me, I mean, it's definitely the music really hits me. Like, even when I was a kid... I didn't know this already. Like, okay, so going back to fifth grade, I went and saw Hook, the movie Hook, and I absolutely adored that film. I was like, I was so obsessed with it. I would have bangerang days. I would dress like a pirate. I I was like the most obsessed about this film. And later on, I watched it like 10 years later as a teenager. And 
I'm going, this movie is like really over the top and just, it's not the best film ever made, you know? And then I realized, you know what? It's the music that I fell in love with as a kid. It's not the movie itself. It was the music and the soundtrack that really stuck with me. And, and it's those moments that I remember most from films as well, like Rescuers Down Under, the opening, the opening moment, and the score that has these horn solos. So for me, it's the music that sticks with me and makes me remember the visuals. What about you, Trisha? Did you know that the guy who played Rufio has a Kickstarter? Yes. <laughs> yeah, and I loved Rufio. Yeah, Rufio. 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 <laughs> I just think that's so funny that he like got it funded so quickly. I'm like, okay, yeah, we're all children at heart. Uh huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> Rufio, Rufio needs a movie. <laughs> He's like, what? I don't know. The Han Solo of of Hook, maybe? I don't know. Something I don't know, like- but I was at a convention and I saw two people dressed as Rufio and the uh, um, Peter Pan from, from Hook. And I was like, oh my gosh, you guys are from Hook. And I like freaked out. Awesome. I, I have to say on the on your question though, for me, the storytelling structure and the character motivation, oh, it always comes back to that for me. So if a story starts falling apart, uh, as far as I don't understand why something happened, then that's when I, and people are like, oh, you're so critical. But there are plenty of movies that it does work for and I have no problem with them. So that's the thing that always, I don't have to go back and go, well, why did this happen? Or why did that character do that? Because I think it should be in the screenplay. I think it should happen for a reason and good screenwriters like Michael Ernst can make that happen. So, mm-hmm. you know, I also adore costumes. Yes. I love costumes. Ugh. I think for me, it's actually sort of an interesting combination of the two of of y'all's things. It sort of combines, and for me, that a movie needs to elicit some sort of emotion from me mm. and make me have that like choked up moment. Not necessarily choked up to cry, but whether I'm sort of amped up because I'm upset and I'm angry and it's making me mad, or because it's making me sad. Or, you know, whatever, like, if I have an emotional response to a movie, then I know that I've connected with it. And a lot of people, I've heard people say, oh, well, I didn't like it, you know, it really upset me with this part, or whatever. And I, my question is always, well, doesn't that make it a good movie then? And they're like, well, no, because it made me mad. And I'm like, but that's what a movie is supposed to do. It's supposed to reach you at your core and make you feel something. And if it makes you feel something, then it's done its job. Mm -hmm. And for every person, it's not always going to be the same message. And we're all going to interpret stories differently. But what does it make us feel and what does it make us relate to? And even if you have really negative emotions because a movie struck a chord in you a certain way or whatever, you make a connection with it Mm -hmm. and it sticks out in your head. So for me, that's what matters. And if I come out of a movie and I'm just kind of like, well, eh, I mean, I didn't really have any kind of connection to it. There was no emotional anything for me, then that's when I know that a movie's just not hitting the mark. And so I always look for that, that emotional part of it, no matter what the emotion is. Do you guys think that Star Wars will ever, I mean, I know there's all, they say, oh, you know, move the pop culture movies get screwed. But do you think there is a future where a Star Wars movie could win something like best picture or best editing or best screenplay? In the future. For me personally, I think it would have to be one of the spinoff films. I don't think one of the numbered films will do it. Because for like a best original screenplay or for editing, that it what it looks like to me is that where the original Playground was in 1977 with the original movie. And they did all these innovations and stuff where they're taking those liberties and playing and changing things and doing stuff different is the spinoffs. Right. And so I think that it they may have a chance for those. But with the traditional Skywalker story and the numbered films, if they veer too far off of what we as fans are used to, they're going to get so much backlash that I don't think they have a lot of room 
to make the technical improvements and the other things that they need to in order to win some of that stuff. Well, who was it that tweeted and had seen Mark Hamill in The Last Jedi and they tweeted something like, Mark Hamill should win Best Actor next It was J.J. Abrams who That's said right. he would. Yes. <laughs> so interesting about that. Now, do you think that was a st- uh, publicity stunt or what, what do you think? Mark Hamill has serious chops. Yes. I, I, I mean, he ha- <laughs> people don't give him enough credit for having serious chops, but he does. And do I think he could earn a nomination? Absolutely, I think he could. I think that this would be, if it were a director to get it out of him, it would be Ryan Johnson. Mm. And it, I it, I don't see Nine it happening with that movie for a lot of reasons, unless some things change. But Ryan Johnson, we <laughs> talked about him on Hyperspace Theories. He knows storytelling. He knows genre. He knows how to play with stuff. And he's an really great actors have gone to him and worked with him over the time. And I think it's because he is an actor's director and he could make it happen. So huh. yes, I, I think, but I agree with Teresa. Most likely it's a spinoff that goes someplace totally. I mean, look at what movie got out of Marvel side. Deadpool was the one that got the most buzz for anything award season this year. And that was the one who that did things that you weren't supposed to do, right? That was, it broke all conventional wisdom. And here we are with Logan right now. And every, I don't see anything but praise for this movie online and people are going crazy and it's an R movie. You shouldn't do this. Wolverine was the first two weren't that great. And now people are like, Oh my God, this is the best thing ever. So it, it went against all the, the grain of thinking. So that's it. I mean, Star Wars, got those awards for going against the grain. And I think that's what they're going to have to do. be a little brave and also maybe give the movie a little time. Cause you know, they get so excited. Yes. We have to put this in the, in the hopper and we need to make this fast, but we forget how much time was and energy was put into just making a new hope just to get it created. And that's the movie that really is, is kind of the darling for a lot of reasons. It really is an awesome script. It really is edited really well. So it's all it's all the things that it, it got lauded for. Well, right. and here's something else that just occurred to me that might be a hindrance for our Star Wars films is right now they're being released in December just in time to make it for that particular year's Oscar season or awards season, which means the movie doesn't have a lot of time to simmer. It doesn't have a lot of time for people to watch it over and over for it to come out on DVD and for the people that are voting to really have some time with the movie. And that could possibly be something that is a negative Now, the Han Solo film will come out in May. So that could, we may see a little bit of a shift with that one if it does get nominated for stuff because they have more time with it. Yeah, very true. Well, I always cross my fingers for the Star Wars films to be nominated for anything, and I'm always rooting for them. So that's my my MO. (laughs) Well, hey, it's always an, an honor to be nominated, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's such bull. (laughs) (laughs) I want to (laughs) win. No. (laughs) Well, in one way that Star Wars is winning right now, and this moves us into our next topic of conversation, is the new canon. And for me, this was something I wanted to bring in to talk to you guys about because I haven't gotten to talk Star Wars with with you in a while. And we just had this really cool episode of Star Wars Rebels, the Secret Cargo episode. And something I've noticed is how every single little thing in the new canon, whether it's books and junior novels and spinoff films and the TV shows and everything... It's all so connected, and there's pieces in everything, and I have never been more excited in my life. (laughs) Thank you, story group. (laughs) Yeah, right? And we should remind our Skywalkers that Secret Cargo is the episode in which Mon Mothma was the secret cargo, and at the end is when she makes her speech above Dantooine and brings the Star Wars Rebels together to form the Star Wars Alliance. Mm-hmm. Uh, hey, Sarah. Yes. You said Skywalkers. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> 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 Listeners, Skywalkers.
Skywalkers. Come on, I do a weekly Skywalking Through Neverland show. It sticks. I'm sorry, guys. I got guys. confused. Well, then I got confused because I was like, is she talking about something from Skywalking Through Neverland? Or like, and then you, anyway. I'm so, sorry. Okay. No, it's okay. So, okay. So with the new canon, what is exciting you guys the most? Because I'll tell you, like right now for me, if it helps, like for me, it's the fact that Rebels could basically be its own Star Wars movie. Like, all of it, just all at one big, huge, giant movie marathon of all of these things. And it exists in this plane where this animated TV show is just as much a part of the core Star Wars story as anything else, like any of the films. And I know The Clone Wars was intended to be that way, but and I love it. But it just didn't feel like this. Really? I don't... Have, maybe it's because it didn't really have any direct... Maybe it did because it didn't have an end that it was going to. Like, oh. Rebels is building this rebellion. Like, it's building in this whole area of time that we know nothing about. Right. And... and there's, it- yeah, you're right. And when Clone Wars was out, there was no movies for it to build toward or anything like that that it could link to. So because Star Wars is is alive right now, for lack of a better term, you know, they're producing movies every year. They're, uh, they have the books coming out, everything. Uh, and they have a story group. Thank you, story group. The story group is what is tying everything together and creating all those those uh, little Easter eggs and, and things that tie together that you so love, Teresa. So mm-hmm. I, I think that that may be the difference that you're feeling. Maybe. And Trisha, what about you for this? Because you grew up at a, a much different time than me when, you know, the books were coming out, but they weren't actually connected, but it was cool to have new stories. How is this feeling different? And are you more excited? Well, the most important thing is the expanded universe at the end before they did their reboot was doing these long series and the stories are essentially being dictated by an author or two authors plus some editors and they weren't storytellers. This is a big, big reason that they were struggling. Mm. And so the story group, I'm still trying to, the story group is there, but there seem to be doing some type of disconnection. There's also what I see as a brain trust. So the story group's there to make sure there's weaving and in and out. But, you know, they never say Dave Filoni's in the story group, right? Right. They never say that. But he's obviously weaving stuff in. There's obviously connections he's making to Rogue One with Star Wars Rebels as oversight. And he talks a lot about being with Kiri Hart. I see her as a person who brought in the story group. But again, I don't see her as the story group, as how they're starting to present it. They did originally. But this episode, Secret Cargo, should have been in the film as far as what we saw Mon Mothma do. And I wrote as much about that is that this was supposed to be the time when the rebel alliance was formed and we were supposed to see these drastic moves and it became so much about Jin making a move that they literally undercut Mon Mothma and the rebel alliance I mean she had to be this huge important person but the great thing is that Star Wars Rebels is showing that you can do a serial storytelling, whether it be a book or comic or whatever, because so much of what people know about Star Wars is this two hour film format that gives you things about characters, but doesn't give you a lot about the characters. So, you know, you get to kind of dive into a character, get to see Mon Mothma. We get to know Ezra. We know more about Ezra than we know about Luke Skywalker. (laughs) That's true. Wow. So, I mean, we know, we know more about Kanan not then Obi Wan Kenobi because that wouldn't be an equivalent, but say Qui Gon Jinn if we were gonna say right. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, but I mean, we know a lot about Obi Wan Kenobi. Who that's another testament to that character that they've managed to keep. I mean, you could really make him kind of mess him up for what why people love Obi Wan, but they've managed to always stay on target with him, which is kind of make him a tragic figure who always just keeps it up and going. A lot of that I 
I give to James Arnold, Arnold Taylor for just getting the pluck of the man, you know, sort of the, <laughs> the wit of him. But I, I'm in love with what we can see where they can go in other places. But I definitely think that there's a lot of it I'm going to attribute it to Dave Filoni. So I think he, even when we went to to London, they made a point in the Future Filmmakers panel saying how they felt it was so awesome when they had him on set. So I feel like he's an important wow. part of what's going on. And he's not the story group. So, but he's certainly laying, has, he was the person who listened to George Lucas. He was the person who sat closest to the book. Yep. You know, we always talk about the book. If anybody, someday that book will be in a library or a museum or something under like a, a ray shield. Um, <laughs> Are you talking about the book of just Star Wars in general? George Lucas's book. It's the his little binder of his, notes. His binder of notes that says what what Star Wars is. It's kind of like the galaxy far, far away in a binder that walked around in this galaxy. Wow. Yeah. You know, it, it, for me, I love all the tie-ins. I love being able to read the books and being able to catch little nuances from things that I've seen in TV show episodes, you know, or little tie in things. It's just, it's so cool to be able to do that because it enriches the world and it creates a, a universe that is so dense with information, but so wonderful at the same time. And it, I think that is truly the power of Star Wars. And I think that's why it has so many fans and so many people that stay actively engaged. Because there's little new things all the time. Well, it's yeah. kind of like J.K. Rowling's Twitter account <laughs> for <laughs> Harry Potter. Yeah. You know? Well, I mean, Star Wars is the modern mythology. And there's a reason that myths exist. And it's it helps you understand why we're here or who we are. And Star Wars is doing that for modern times. So... I think it's wonderful and that's why we have so many Star Wars podcasts and why we're talking about it now and hopefully well into the future. And, you know, one of the things with all of this, I, and I have to just acknowledge this, is that without Disney, a lot of this would not be happening at all had Disney not bought Star Wars. And, I mean, that's just something that we as fans need to recognize because I know there's still people out there that are saying, oh, well, Disney shouldn't have bought it, blah, blah, blah. <sighs> But if Disney hadn't bought it, you wouldn't have all of this amazing stuff that you do. Yeah. Mainly because of money. <laughs> money and the way they market. Marketing. Yeah, that that too. That too. <laughs> oh, those those probably ladies from the marketing that you that you get to meet, like they are like troopers. I oh, don't yeah. even know how they do it. They're they they're like an army. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. They have, to smile, they have to smile and get it done. So we they say thank you for putting up with probably a gazillion people emailing you. What about <laughs> me? What about me? Can I interview? Can I interview? Yep. Can I do this? Can I do that? We want this. We want that. We're so needy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a symbiotic relationship. It is. True. It is. So just like we have a symbiotic relationship with the marketing department, uh, we also do not exist as a show without all of you, our listeners. So that brings us to Roll It, Rob Dellinger. Shout it out, shout it out to the social media from Teresa and Trisha and Sarah. Shout it out, shout it out, fangirl shout outs. Well, we have debuted a new Facebook group, Fangirls Going Rogue Facebook group, and it is doing great. In fact, just this past month, we had a live Facebook watch of A New Hope, which Sandra was moderating, basically, and it it is so cool. Well, you know, along with the Facebook group, we have... 227 members as of this recording and I love how people are sharing even things just like Swara just shared a little while ago a pop vinyl collection and they just got a ray with Aww. the lightsaber pop vinyl <gasps> and so um, and Eric 
Uh, he just posted today, too, that my celebration app just updated to Orlando. So everybody's getting really excited. And I love that people just share these little nuggets of yes. things that are that are super just, you know, I mean, very cool and stuff we care about. You know, and it's not necessarily necessarily stuff you can just put on your news feed. I mean, if Eric put on his main feed, my celebration app just updated to Orlando, a lot of his friends might be like, okay. But <laughs> if he puts it in our group, we're like, yeah! Yeah, let's check my celebration app. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then we all crashed it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> That's funny. And Scott, uh, so if you want to join the Facebook group for Fangirls Going Rogue, all you have to do is find the group on Facebook. So search Fangirls Going Rogue Facebook group and then request to join. And we will see if you are worthy, basically. Basically, if you have a Star Wars photo or something in some of your photos that we can see, usually we'll let you in. All right. Well, our episode we released, You Talk, We Listen. Don't confuse it with We Talk, You Listen, because that's this episode. Uh, we got some great feedback. <laughs> I saw some people actually confused that on Twitter. It was funny. <laughs> so at two times underscore mum, she wrote, just heard the FGGR first episodes of You Talk, We Listen. I really enjoyed listening to it. Looking forward to hearing the next one. So thank you, two times mum. We really appreciate that. And then Franklin Taylor, who is at Spear XXI, he wrote, Finished episode one of You Talk, We Listen. Wonderful chat. I do recommend the novelization by Alexander Freed, as it's beautiful. I believe there was a, a more conversation about that in the Facebook group, too. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, there was. So looks like we got to pick up the novelization. Ha have you read it yet? No, Anybody? I still haven't. <laughs> no, I haven't. Mainly because we don't cover them on bookworms. So yeah. if I'm not covering it on bookworms, I haven't read it. Right. Uh, uh, Which well, is why I don't read much other than Star Wars books. Yeah, right. and Kay on Fangirl gave it a really great review. She she enjoyed it too for the same reasons that people have been talking about it. That it gives you more insight into the characters and stuff like that. Oh wow. Okay. So we love when you tweet at us. We are at FG Going Rogue on Twitter. And we so appreciate that we talk and you listen and you tweet. So thank you, guys. <laughs> well, it's time for Rob Dellinger again. So hit it. Sidious, Anakin, Luke and Leia, Qui-Gon Jinn, C.O. Bibble, Kylo Ren, Salacious Crumb, Bib Fortuna, Boba Fett, Amadala Wicked, R2-D2, BB-8, I can barely keep it straight. It's a character discussion, it's the fangirls on character, it's a character discussion. Okay. So every episode, we have a character discussion, and on this particular episode, I'm not sure who suggested it, but I fully agree, we need to talk about Mon Mothma. And, you know, I never really had a great connection with this character until Rogue One and until Rebels, and now I'm like, woo, Mon Mothma! Absolutely. So, if I'm being really honest, I really didn't understand the point of Mon Mothma before Rogue One and Rebels. So <laughs> that's my bad. I mean, she was there, but I was just kind of like, okay. Well, the only time we see her in the original trilogy is Return of the Jedi, just that, that room, right? The the Alliance, what do you call it? Briefing chamber. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're all going to die. We're all yes. going to die or not, which is the Bothans Rogue died one. and then we're all going to die. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it keeps happening. We're all going to die if we don't do something. Right. So, yeah. She's the one who delivers it and looks really calm when she's probably sweating. <laughs> and... Many Bothans died to bring us this information. Yeah, she probably has like tissues under that white robe, like under her arms. She's like, oh. <laughs> Oh well, gosh. yeah, because they don't have underwear in space. Right. <laughs> At least Carrie Fisher says so. <laughs> or underarm guards or something. <laughs> okay, wow. This Poor took a turn. Mothma. She needs more <laughs> dignity than this. Actually, for Mon Mothma as a character, I have loved the character for a long time, and she has a 
big fan base in the fanfic community from Ooh. way back when. So yeah, you can you can read all about her in fanfic for over the years. And she was in the expanded universe and would come and go. And I loved her in Lost Stars. That's one of my favorite little you get to see little peekies of her there. Oh, that's uh, right. Yes, with drunk Thane. What? Oh yes, yeah. drunk Thane. Yes, that's drunk what Thane. Said. Yes. <laughs> Drunk Thane, and you could see her humanity and kind of, I mean, if you just, if you guys looked at her, okay, and you said, this is a woman and she's in charge of those rebels that are going to go against the second Death Star, against this Emperor guy who obviously we know from the prequel trilogies has got his stuff together, and he has the Force, and she's going to lead people against this, and they've stayed with her. I would imagine she's an amazing person. Maybe a little tough, too. Oh, definitely. So. Yeah, you know, for me, and I don't know why I never realized how important she was. I mean, I guess I knew that she was an important person. But I didn't realize until the new canon and with her appearance in Bloodline and how Leia talks about her in Bloodline and then in Lost Stars. And then, of course, with this most recent episode of Rebels, just how vitally important she was to the Rebellion and to just making it happen. And that scene in, spoiler alert, in Secret Cargo when she finishes her speech and she just says, well, now we wait. We will not rest until we bring an end to the Empire, until we restore our Republic. Are you with me? And then all these ships just start showing up. I was like, I was like a rhino from Bolts when he's like, let it begin, let it begin. (laughs) I know, that was super exciting to see that moment and... Like, I just, I wanted to see this episode, like we said, on the big screen, because this this is such an important moment in Star Wars history. The fact that she says this speech, she, re- she resigns from the the council and, and becomes the leader of the Alliance, essentially, because of this speech and her actions. They came. Look how many there are. This, my friends, this is our rebellion. It's, it's an amazing moment. Like, who, who else got teary-eyed? I got teary-eyed I through, the whole, through the whole... When she talks to Hera specifically, mm. like, I was already tearing up. To me, that scene felt like... I felt sometimes being a blogger talking about women in Star Wars. Sometimes I envy pilots like you, traveling through the stars. You can always leave your problems far behind you. Can't imagine you running from your problems. I've spent my life in the Senate, trying to do good, to preserve the rights of the people. And we are grateful. A little good it's done. So, if you give it a relatable moment, where you're like, I don't know if I'm ever going to see a day when we have gender parity in Star Wars. I don't know if we'll ever see a day we'll have a female director and she's there going, I don't know what's going to happen, but I had to make a choice. I had to do something because what I was doing wasn't working. I was trying to make a difference. But if that's what it takes, whatever it takes, this rebellion is worth it. So Mm -hmm. it was a very relatable moment to me. And yes, I got very teary eyed and there's, there are really cool things about getting to see, screeners they're really not cool things because you could see an episode and run around in your room like an idiot because you're so (laughs) excited and you're crying and then you're like oh I can't even talk to anybody about this so yeah so I was like for me I was like oh I can't wait till everybody sees I can't wait till everybody sees this and then I just sat there and watched everybody tweet because I was like well they're gonna go through it too it was I I thought the people reacted to it in the same way Oh. So when when did y'all see this? I saw it the, what Sunday morning. So after okay. it had aired. Yeah. So Trisha, did you see this like saw it the Monday before it aired? Oh wow. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So you had to wait. I had to wait. Yes. And run around your room with your dogs. I don't know if people know this too. If you have a DVR that record can record it. Yeah. In the morning, it will come up and play. That's very true. It it did come up for me, but I couldn't watch it until the next day. Ah. (laughs) Because I have to watch it with Richard. Because if we don't watch it together, that's just wrong. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, my uh, me on the other hand, I'm watching it with a husband who's like, who's Mon Mothma? Oh. And I was, and I just looked at. It, I was like, "Are you serious right now?" And it was convenient. They played a commercial for Rogue One during it, and I paused it, and I was like, "That is Mon Mothma from Rogue One." I remember? <laughs> and he goes, "Oh yeah, isn't she in one of the other ones?" Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. I was like, "Yeah, go back to your roller coaster." Oh. Well, it was really uh, cool too because we got Genevieve O'Reilly who played. Yes. Her in the movie, who also played her in Revenge of the Sith, but really got cut out of most of it. She, you know, we just get to see her, the visual of her. So it was nice. I mean, they're they're getting some amazing actors and actresses to come back and do animation in and of itself is kind of crazy cool that, that they're doing that. But I, you know, I actually wrote an article about what happened in this in this episode, in a children's show, Ugh. is we actually saw Mon Mothma have agency as a character, which hasn't happened. And it's not bad that a character doesn't have agency in a story if they're a secondary or, or tertiary character, if they're not in the foreground. But with a character like this, I would have thought Rogue One would have given her agency. And what that means is agency is, is that you understand she's making a decision and you understand why. That mm. she is acting and choosing. It doesn't have to be a good choice. It could be a bad choice. But in Rogue One, she essentially they she gets she talks to Jin and Jin's talking to her, but there's a lot of other characters in the room, and she just becomes part of the exposition in right. that scene. And then when they make the big decision in the big conference room again later, we don't see her doing anything that you would think a woman who's been the woman that does the moment in Secret Cargo is not in Rogue One. Right. She doesn't do anything actively. She just sits there and she goes, well, Jen, sorry, the odds are too great. Right. That's, her, that's her line. So she doesn't do anything in that movie, which is really disappointing. Because I, if I were giving storytelling notes to that, I would have said, you need to take one scene out and give it just to Mon Mothma and Jin. To show Mon Mothma to be the person that she is. And it didn't happen on film. It happened in the animated show. I'm very glad it happened in the animated show. But I feel like sometimes Star Wars Rebels is, keeps repudiating things that happen in Rogue One. You know, we people complained about there not being enough people of color in the Empire. First episode out of the box, we get a woman of color in charge in the Empire. Hmm. This we have on Mothma. So, you know, sometimes they're filling in gaps that that didn't necessarily happen. So uh, yay for agency for Ma Mothma. <laughs> now here, here's Woo-hoo. a really good, important question. Which outfit for Ma Mothma do we like the best? Wait, they're not all <laughs> the same? Yes. Well, she, has, she has a pantsuit. <laughs> where, where does she have the pantsuit? In the Rebels. In Rebels, she has a pantsuit. But real and... Okay, like the pantsuit is a is now a symbol like of kind of, you know, women taking charge in general uh-huh. in our own. But the reason she has a pantsuit is likely because this was made a long time ago. And Dave Filoni likes to tell us how much it costs to make cloth. He, You know, he's like, <laughs> oh, God, Vader's got a cape. Oh, Lord, that's going to take so much rendering. <laughs> So, Mon Mothma has a pantsuit probably because of budgetary reasons yep. and also a little bit of computer time. But I'll take it. <laughs> That's nice. Uh, and she still has that metal medallion around her neck, which mm-hmm. is interesting. I want to know how they came up with her name because it sounds like a bug. Uh, you know, like a... Yeah, that... Yeah, I, I don't know. Let's see. Should Mon I check Mothma. my visual encyclopedia? Would she be in here? Huh? I don't think that how she <laughs> I don't got think her it's name. Gonna tell you. Yeah, I don't think how her name is going to be in that one. It's probably, well, it's a George Lucas name. I mean, he, Mace Windu is probably recycled from something in his original Star Killer iteration or something like that. I'm totally probably. making stuff up and this will end up on it Wikipedia. It sounds good. It sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just waiting for it to be on Wikipedia just because I said it. It's not true. Well, I don't I'll know. go put it I'll go put it in there for you. Yeah. I'll make an account. <laughs> Rebels. 
leadership. Mon Mothma is a longtime opponent to Palpatine and serves as a civilian leader in the Alliance. She works alongside military leaders like Admiral Akbar, who focus their efforts on building a fighting force that can stand up to the enormous Imperial War Machine. There you go. Did you write that, Trisha? Honestly, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> and there, wait, there's one more. Okay. Oh, here we go. This is Military Officers, the Rebel Alliance. Chancellor Mon Mothma, once a senator and leader of the Rebel Alliance, becomes the first new chancellor in decades following the Emperor's defeat. She has the difficult task of rebuilding the Galactic Senate, which was disbanded before the Battle of Yavin. There you go. Very so nice. Very cool. It didn't say anything about her name. I'm very disappointed in the authors of this book of the visual encyclopedia. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> yeah, but it's supposed to be an in it's an in universe. So it won't tell you how she got her name. Okay. <laughs> I know I had a lady that was that asked me at a book talk, she's like, Why is your name not on the cover of that book? Why is your name not on that cover? And I'm like, Cause it's supposed to be an in universe encyclopedia. So in theory, I wouldn't be an author because I'm from another universe. And then I was like, No, that would really blow our mind. So I'll just go, I'm not on my name's not on oh, the well, cover. Well, well. Uh, I thought that I thought you actually told her that she was probably like, uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> I want to be like, can I explain to you the flash? No. <laughs> <laughs> we aren't on Earth, right? Well, no. right, we're on Earth exactly. <laughs> this yeah, we're Earth on one. Earth two. I love how in the flash, <laughs> I love that how in the flash, like they just de- designated their Earth as Earth one. And everyone else right? is like accepting the fact that they're Earth Two or Earth Nineteen. It's like, no, <laughs> I want to be Earth One. Damn it! That's just me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, that brings us to the end of another fun show. But so much more to come, including so much from Star Wars Celebration and our coverage of that. So, in between shows, you can visit us over. We're at fangirlsgoingrogue.com. You can find us on Twitter. We are at FG Going Rogue. Trisha is at Fangirl Cantina. I am at Ice Cold Penguin. And Sarah is at Jedi Tink. And you can email us. We are contact at fangirlsgoingrogue.com. So especially if you want to do a You Talk, We Listen, please email us. Let us know what you would like to talk about. That would be great. Uh, also, you can join us on Facebook. We have a Fangirls Going Rogue Facebook page. And you can request to join the Fangirls Going Rogue Facebook group, which is a closed group. And it's amazing because you can not only interact with us, but you can interact with other listeners of the show. Not Skywalker but listeners of Fangirls Going Rogue. And that is the fun. You can make friends. You can talk about Wonder Woman or Moana yeah. Ooh, or that's true. anything. Or Tangled yeah. the series. Tangled the series. Ah, ah. Okay. Oh, she's having a moment. <laughs> you can and will only find Star Wars on our Tumblr, fangirlsgoingrogue.tumblr.com. You can follow us on Instagram at fggoingrogue or leave us a voicemail, 33121EWOKS. That's 331-213-9657. Or please go to iTunes or whatever podcatcher you're listening to and leave us a positive five-star review. We need your reviews. We love your reviews. The more people that review us, the higher we get ranked. Woohoo! So, everyone, until next time. da 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 Yub. 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 And before we cut the recording, a very, very happy birthday to me Woohoo. and Sarah. Woohoo! So happy birthday! And the opening of Tangled! Before Ever After! <laughs> <laughs> the new Disney Channel movie, which is also premiering on March 10th. It's an exciting day on social media. I agree. It's going to be insane. <laughs> it's going to be an insane Friday. So many birthdays, so many fun things. Yes. Let's just hope someone's listening.